Welcome to the Femsplainers. This is Christina Hoff Summers. And this is Danielle Crittenden. I have to phone in to this week's episode um, because I am in Palo Alto for these couple of weeks. And it's a long story and it's a stressful story. Um, but Christina, you and I have both had a couple of very rough and emotional weeks, not least because you were, aside from going to, what, 100 campuses and getting yelled at, um, you, you had a memorial service for your mother. I'm dealing with a serious health issue with my eldest daughter. So the good thing is this is the last episode of season three. So we're going to take a week's break next week and be back stronger May 14th. But I but, uh, hope you'll forgive the poor quality of, of my connection. Well, it has been, uh, for me, like a stressful month because mm. first there was Australia and then the campus tour, which was a mix of reactions. There were, I went to colleges like Skidmore and UCLA Law, just full of extremely angry young women. But then at UCSB and University of Santa Cruz, they were great fans of the Femsplainers. And they were, they were, they couldn't have been nicer, and they were so smart and wonderful. But what, what, go ahead. What, do, what, what is, what is that you notice about the differences between these two audiences? Like, how do you tell, or how do you um, explain where you get a good reception and where you get a bad reception? I can never predict, and of course, it depends a lot on the audience. So, at I would say at UCSB and Santa Cruz was mostly fans. And that's a lot of fun, and they appreciate. But is it? Are, is that because it's being hosted by? Well, they were. Know, they um, were all hosted. Conservative. Groups, they were all hosted or? by conservative organizations because liberal organizations don't invite me to campus. But the the Which is young, young America's Foundation and the Federalist Society often invite me, and so I'm able to visit a lot of campuses. But I just never know who will come, and in the case of the University of. Um, uh, at UCLA Law School, the audience was divided in half, and half of the room was full of women, probably members of the UCLA, you know, Women's Law Review, and the other half was, you know, just r- smart, re- reasonable, normal law students. But these women were frantic and furious, and they kept, you know, raising their hands while I was speaking to get me to stop, and I said, no, I'll take questions afterwards, and they were triggered. And then they, uh, one after the other, they would just shoot these questions. And they, the whole time they had, they had their computers open and they were typing and researching. It was just get the guest. There was were, no, they, were they questions or statements? Statements, angry statements and insults. What are your credentials? I see you haven't had a peer review article since you were a philosophy professor, you know, X number of years ago. <laughs> and they, and yeah. it, it wasn't, I just would ask them, you know, how is that relevant to my evidence. And you can check right. the evidence yourself. Um, but it did, none of it mattered. And, and I actually worry that there is a, a kind of contagion of hysteria, and it can strike very smart people, because I presume you have to be extremely intelligent to get into UCLA Law School. Well, this is my beef on behalf of you. It, this just really bugs me all the time, is you really represent a liberal centrist view of not just women, but the world in general. And when you were on your tour, your talking tour in uh, Australia with Roxane Gay, right. which was, by, by the way, just wonderfully and hilariously written up in New York Magazine. We've linked to it on our Facebook, and of course you've tweeted about it, and the Femsplainers Twitter account has tweeted about it, but a really wonderful write-up. Where oh, Jesse Signal, shows- yeah. Right. And Roxanne Gay, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a bias, it's a very straight write-up, but she is such a diva. Uh, she doesn't want any contradiction. In fact, where there were contradict, uh, where, where she felt she hadn't come off as well as she'd hoped, she tried to demand that that be removed from the upcoming video, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, if she, she She wanted to change the moderator, uh, she wanted to change, and we talked about this when you got back from that tour. Yeah, she wanted her in the middle. She didn't like completely yeah, unreasonable and anti any opinion that's not hers. And yet, you know, she's 
going on than the Andy Cohen show because she's seen as the reasonable person and you're seen as the, you know, the radical. And oh, no, I saw her recently on the reverse. Uh, I mean, it may have been an old podcast, but she was on with the comedian Sarah, Sarah Silverman, who was promoting oh, I love Sarah Silverman. I do, too. But she wouldn't have me on, but she had Roxanne on and was promoting her as, you know, this great voice for women. And she and, yeah. and Roxanne is very irrational, in my opinion. And, you know, she called me a white supremacist. We talked about that. You know what it was like? Uh, not that you have seen Rocky four, but anyone no, out there? Finally, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> it so was I put Rocky. It on my list of watch lists. Well, it was Rocky, sort of on his own against the Russian, and the Russian had a whole. Oh, I did see that. He had a I whole team that. of experts and getting steroid shots and you know all this high tech equipment for, to train him. And an entourage of doctors and advisors. It was like that with her. She, she had agents and a, this team back home of lawyers and advisors, and they were all madly, I don't know, texting and emailing poor Desh, this wonderful guy who had invited us and organized this thing. And they were, you know, they, that was where they pressured him to remove the moderator. How dare you ask her these, you know, unfair questions? And as you said, I think she thought they were unfair because it seemed unabnormal to her to be challenged in any way. Yeah, like even on the weather, you know? Right. It looks overcast. No, it's not. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was nuts. Anyway, I thought that was a wonderful write-up. And you, you came off as just like the most, not just reasonable in your opinions, but reasonable in, in like, oh, sure, if she wants to change the moderator, that's fine. You know, like, whatever. <laughs> well, I was worried about you say that about uh, Dash, Dash, like dealing with yeah, he was dealing with this you know nightmare client who he could not please. Or anyway, it was funny. Um, it was worth reading, and I I hope the video comes out. It's out actually. Oh, is it? Yeah, okay, I'm afraid well, to watch definitely. it. I'm afraid to watch. It. I'll watch it. We'll link. To watch it. it, and they. I'm it... going to have popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just because I was. Every time I said anything, the audience would boo, and then no matter what she said, however prosaic, riotous, rapturous cheering, and it was unnerving. So I'm just afraid that I was rattled. But uh, I don't know. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll I'll watch it for you and and tell you if it's safe to watch. You know, it's like when you close your eyes during like violent movies and things. And uh, the other person has to say, "You can look now," and it's fine. Um, but uh, but you also you also had a memorial service for your mom, and and, and, for, and, it, and it was for Malibu? my dad too. Oh, sorry, Santa Monica. In Monica? Santa Monica, yeah, your dad. And we hadn't even asked for this, but because we were bearing their ashes in near my grandma and my my aunt, and the I don't know how this happened, but the military alerted us and said Kenneth Hoff, my dad. They said he was, you know, a war hero and. Um, we uh, we have a s ceremony, and they came, and these officers came, and they played taps and did a flag ceremony, and then mm. gave me the flag, and it was so moving and so beautiful. My dad was on a, a ship in the Philippines and um, treated people that had been in the Bataan March and you know in the camps in the Philippines and you know close to death, and he saved a lot of people. But anyway. It was just very, it was for my both my parents, and we, we, it was remarkable. But so many things in so few days, because I had just come from not only lecturing at the University of Santa Cruz, which went well, but I saw you and your daughter Mandy the night before she went, well, you tell the story of what you've been doing. Oh, I was so glad you were here. <laughs> what a fortuitous I know. Uh, moment that you had to lecture at Santa Cruz the night before. I, I was with my daughter. She was being treated at Stanford. Actually, listeners may remember remember that Miranda, who's 27, has come on and, and femsplained about dating. She developed, uh, uh, David says I can't call it benign because that implies like it's nice. Uh, he says it's a non-malignant tumor, uh, brain tumor. And, um, and it turned out to be a very, very difficult and tricky. I, I said, Miranda, you're 
original and rare in everything you do, including the brain tumors you get. And um, so she had this very difficult tumor, and uh, she we found an amazing surgeon. You you have a total crush on him, as I kind of do too. He saved my daughter's life, and he's a genius, uh, he's and also, an artist. I mean, to, to, he's also named Dr. Miranda. Yeah. <laughs> But it's just but, uh, that he could do that kind of thing. I mean, she had this very difficult tumor that was threatening her optic nerve wrapped around the pituitary gland. I mean, it was in a... It was pushing up her oh. brain. I mean, it was just... And, and we only found out about it really last Thanksgiving. And, um, you know, she's having some vision problems, some hormonal problems. But, you know, it never occurs to you, oh, there must be a tumor. So when we got the tumor news, news that was kind of surreal. And then, we, you know, she, we, she was trapped in a horrific healthcare situation where the people who were going to do her brain surgery in Los Angeles, where she had been living, um, were, were suggesting that they'd cut, you know, sort of Frankenstein 1930s Boris Karloff era, cut open the top of her head to get to a brain tumor oh, at the I still base can't of her brain. And this just didn't seem right to me so then as you know you followed you were you know with us through this we found this remarkable surgeon we had to go through this terrible fight to get her off her crappy insurance and onto good insurance so she could be treated by this um, amazing surgeon and but it was a real lesson to me aside I mean so many takeaways but one of the things I just felt is what if I had not found Dr. Miranda. You know that people often don't get second opinions. They trust, you know, they trust their the medical advice they receive. Yeah, and I will and, add, I will add, she had a great advocate in her mother. Mm-hmm. Well, because you've you, told me but, about these doctors, they did not want to allow you to go outside the system. And you were right. like Marissa Tomei in my cousin <laughs> Vinny. <at on. laughs> Let me tell you what kind of brain tumor she yeah, has. With more information. I researched the hell out of it. They were just gasping. Uh, but it was rare. I mean, none of these doctors at her previous insurance had seen it, had ever come across it. So they were treating it as this completely normal thing. But the thing that t- twigged me was and to get this second opinion outside of the system and turns out with a sort of preeminent expert surgeon was um, that it was, they said, well, it's in a kind of tricky place in her brain. You know, it's not the usual kind of basic brain tumor. And then the minute they said it was tricky and the minute they said, and the way we're going to deal with it is cut open her head like Frankenstein. That was where I thought, you know what? I think we need to find another, at least get another opinion. They may well be right. And I think um, what I learned from previous health situations in our family, it's one of the great lessons, I think. David's mother, who my husband's mother who died in her 50s, is just unbelievable from lymphoma and had struggled with this for 20 years. She, she was the one who said that every patient needs an advocate, like a, usually in your family, somebody who is outside of you, basically, who is listening to the doctor, who is questioning the doctor, because when it's your condition, you often don't hear the doctor. Like you're told you have a brain tumor and then it's like, blah, 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 blah. But you want that, that outside advocate for you, just taking notes and, and, and looking to help you, help you make the right decisions. And so I, yeah, I became that person for Miranda, but of course her mother. So how could I not be? But she, the, the upshot is you were with us literally the night before she went in and the day that she went in and you saw her I in know. the ICU after a 10-hour terrifying surgery. And, and the night before she was so brave and, you know, was up with us. And, and jolly. Jolly and, and yeah. just <laughs> incredible. And now it's a week and a day. She's, um, two days. Yeah, later. she's just just passing passing a week and two days. She's remarkable, and she's. She um, had ice cream, and I saw a picture. Yeah, of her I took her into looking glamorous. Palo Alto. In the, in the... <laughs> ice, the salt and straw. Everybody, you can order it online. Best ice cream in the world. And I, she had this craving. I said, "Well, let's do it." So we we did, and that was like her first outing. So, no, she's recovering very well, and the doctor says, you know, the surgeon says she will. She will be able to live a normal life. And it's also one of the things, I don't know if you've ever had this, Christina, but 
you know, you, you get some health issue and you tell somebody about it and you find out like 9,000 people you know have gone through this. And you'd be amazed at how many people have, brain to, have had brain tumors and also at the level of expertise they have now. I, I mean, one of the reasons I think she's doing so well is not least because of her surgeon but, and her youth, of course, but she, the, the, the surgery now, I mean, they went through her nose. They didn't cut the top of her head open. Uh, they did it sort of endoscopically. And, um, and you, you just recover so much better when it's, you know, less intrusive. I mean, it's bad enough as it is, but well, I once anyway, had, thank I, God I had she's come through it. A lot less serious, but I had rotator cuff surgery uh, four or five years ago. I felt like it was the weirdest thing in the world, only to find out that all these handsome guys, because I had to like have my arm in this weird contraption for six weeks afterwards, and all these sort of cute guys in their 30s would come up and say, oh, you had rotator cuff surgery. I had it, because it turns out mm-hmm. baseball players, young ones, you know, who play like Little League yeah. in college and high school, they have to have it. And then I found like everybody, I didn't even know what a rotator cuff was until I had to have the surgery, but everybody's had it. But I didn't know that about brain tumors. But actually, I have been yeah. telling people, and they're, they all know somebody, coming. you know, who's yeah. had a benign tumor. So, oh, gosh. Anyway, I'm well, so Miranda's grateful. Been very, Miranda, as you know, is an extremely witty person, and she, she was talking like while we're, you know, in the couple months as we're researching and getting MRIs and things, she, she developed a hashtag she called tumor humor, and she would make <laughs> jokes or I would make jokes, and we were allowed to make jokes about it. But one of the most poignant things she said, she asked her dad, she said, she said, Dad, when? When, on a, when you're dating somebody, on what date do you tell them you have a brain tumor? <laughs> she, called, she called this dating with brain tumor. And, that, and her father said, well, you know, I think, look, if you were once a man and are now a woman, I think you have to own up to that right away on the first day. <laughs> but but you, know, you don't know anybody an explanation, you know, at least until date four or five, if you think there's any seriousness. But like, this is, she's going to, I'm begging her to write a column about this when she's better. Anyway, it's been, it's been quite a thing, but we're very grateful. And Palo Alto is lovely. And Stanford is the most amazing hospital I think I have ever been in. Does she still Um, have to go back? Yeah, just some tests. And we we can, we're hoping to come home in a, you know, in a week or so, but she, um, I mean, it's like a, it's so beautiful here. And the facility itself, like everybody is happy. Um, the nurses are amazing. And I, I said to her surgeon, I said, you know, this isn't even like a hospital. This is like a hospital facility that just happens to have sick people in it because, you know. I, always find, I, I actually find hospitals inspiring because it's just this center of goodness and an effective altruism. People come and for the most part, are made better. Miraculous. I mean, I've seen family members that just go in in such a terrible condition and they're they're cured. Right. Well, also, we didn't mention this, and then we can change topics, but they let Stanford is dog-friendly. Oh, yes. And Miranda has her little cavalier, King Charles Spaniel, called Ringo, and he's a certified emotional support animal. He has a little, you know, vest. They let him into the ICU I with her was, after I was surgery. so impressed. And he was so well behaved, so much better than Izzy. I don't think Izzy would work <laughs> out in the ICU. <laughs> there would be issues. No, but he just, he just, he was with her at every test. He just sat on her lap. And when she was in ICU, he, he, he knew that he couldn't, he sometimes, he somehow intuited that he couldn't step on her, you know, or do what, like he did. So he just sat in a chair next to her bed and looked at her. It was so He's been so amazing. He's, I saw, he's I was, been an ESA to us all. <laughs> I was with him the, the night before, and I thought he needed to play. And I was a little disapproving that you and bragging that Izzy knew how to fetch. And then I just threw this little device in a little toy, and that dog immediately runs, brings it to me, and sits. Perfect, <laughs> far better than Izzy can do it. So it's like, and, and did you like deliberately train her, him? Or no, but this... Miranda and Miranda has given him a full LA lifestyle. So from the moment she adopted him a year ago when he was a puppy, like he's been, you know, going to the Bel Air hotel for drinks and 
<laughs> well, I think the we have to post side. his picture. I think we have to make uh, Ringo. I will. I will. I will post a picture of him on our Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. But you can see Ringo the Miracle Dog. Well, anyway, anyway go ahead. Okay. So, so um, we're not having a guest this week because for obvious reasons, but um, we do have a lot to sort of just catch up on because you were away and I did the last podcast with our great substitute coast planners, Megan Cox Gurdon. We just have some a couple few articles we want to discuss and then we can catch up on listener reaction and then uh then we'll all take a little bit of a well earned break. Christina, the article I, I think we both most want to talk about just came out in the New York Times about women and work. Right. Uh mothers and work and Again, going back to why are the Roxanne gays listened to as the authority, this New York Times article affirms everything you have said about the pay gap. And if I may say, it has affirmed everything I've said about mothers' preferences when they have children. And uh, let's, let's talk about that. Yes, it's uh, in the New York Times, uh, April 26th, by Claire Kane Miller. Women did everything right, then work got greedy. How America's obsession with long hours has widened the gender gap. And what's very interesting is, and as I have said, and you, that the gender gap, in the pay gap, is not caused by ruthless, unscrupulous employers paying deliberately paying women less for the same work. As this article explains, the gap shows up most uh, and and most pronounced in workers, sort of high-level professions in law, in finance, and uh, jobs where they put a premium on having just unfettered access to your time, where you can go and work crazy hours. And... Mm -hmm. It, it turns out that um, to the extent that anybody's willing to do that, there are just more men than women. And if you are willing to do that at these high-level jobs, there's a huge premium in your pay. So you get very rich. And so the article explains that it, typically it's a man who, in, a, in these power couples. She may be as educated. She may be in the same field, but they have kids and she will often step back and work less and not come anywhere near his earnings, but he will have this uh, super career that can support the family in, you know, very high level. And Right. It said, so, oh, sorry, I, I was just going to say there's a paragraph in it that says, this is not about educated women opting out of work. They are the least likely to stop working after having children, even if they move to less demanding jobs. So yeah, they have also, that means they also have the most fulfilling careers, right? Right. Like, they still want to keep working, even if they don't have to. It said, it's about how the nature of work has changed in ways that push couples who have equal career potential to take on, quote unquote, I'm doing quote unquote, unequal roles. Women don't step back from work because they have rich husbands. They have rich husbands because they step back from work. So that's right. There's somebody in this couple that they profiled. It was like two lawyers with like equal law degrees. And when, when they had their first child, she agreed to step back and she's taken on like a part-time job lawyer position. in I think the New York city government and he, you know, is on the partner track and working the 80 hour work week and, and she's there to be, you know, with the kids and the doctor's appointments and managing that aspect of the household. And and they acknowledge that, you know, they, it couldn't be done if both of them would try to do the, if both of them tried to do the 80-hour work week. And to those in our audience who are thinking, oh, well, why should it be the mother? Well, if you look at studies by Gallup or the Pew research, you find that this is a preference, that if you ask mothers, what is your ideal work situation? Most of them say either working part-time or not at all. And you find only about, well, these data could be a little, I haven't seen the latest data, but as of 2012, um, it was 32% of women wanted to work full-time, even after kids. But 
40, 40, uh, 67, either wanted to work not at all or part-time. Then that was their choice. And for men, it was, it, they, most of them wanted to work full-time. All right, but step back a little from this. Let's say, I mean, I mean exactly. And, this, and you know what? This has been consistent since you and I started writing about this 20 and 30 years ago. Right. That... When, when a woman has a choice, and a lot of women don't have choices, and I think we've talked about this in the past, I think like uh, most women are employed in retail. They're not in jobs they enjoy, and if they had the chance to give up being a cashier, they would heartily take it. We're stepping back to, we're looking at equality from a very rigid, rigid gender perspective, that it can only be, be defined in male and or materialistic terms. So the fact that a woman might want to be with her children is somehow embarrassing, unequal, a poor choice. You know, unless she's earning money and in these cases making partner, somehow it's a, it's a huge sacrifice to want to be with your children. And of course, we can talk about the financial risks and sacrifices that that woman makes, and those are very real especially in a time when uh, marriage is less stable. But, I mean, when I had Miranda, my first child, my immediate impulse was not to say, oh, okay, drop the baby, can't wait to toss her to someone else so I can get back, you know, to working. Like, you don't have, that's not your emotion. And, I mean, I just remember thinking, how am I and how are we as a couple going to make this work so I can spend as much time as I can with her? And, and I think the father feels the same way. It's not like he's brazenly walking out the door and saying, you know, have fun with that. Like children transform your lives. It's the most important contribution we can make to our society, but also the, most, the greatest enrichment to our own lives. And it's being treated as, ugh. Yeah, e even the New York Times. Be in the office. Even the New York Times, this article, which is kind of did, was actually a good uh, analysis a good article, of the yeah. wage gap, but it, it did seem to convey the idea that this was like a bad thing that women did this. Right. And, you know, you say it's the you know, same for fathers. It's not this, quite the same for most men that I've known. They can go away for 40 hours a week. Or not, you know, they're not crestfallen if they can't see the child. But for a lot of yeah. us, it's it, when you have a little baby, you don't want to go away that many hours per week. And, I, and it's, yeah, and it's transformative. I mean, I think because of the way we're taught to think about these things, that's why it was so, I think, shocking when I had, you know, Miranda, my first child, because I had until that moment thought of myself as this completely equal yeah, I'm a girl, but and he's a boy, but we're the same. Like we can do the same things, we can pursue the same careers. Yada yada yada. Yeah, nobody tells then, you that you're going to fall so madly in love with this little creature and, your, and be so bonded and trans. And your body tells you this too. It's yes. like it's not like the man is breastfeeding, you know. Right. And and it's 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 like how can I? I remember looking at this little thing in my arms with the little bright blue eyes that they have right after they're born and just thinking I never want to let you down I never want to you know I, and I, I you, you, you can't you you can't explain this to non-parents you know who only see you know the noisy kids in restaurants but you can't explain to them although I will but, tell you my, when I, I yeah. first had David my mother was there doing everything and then she left and then I thought oh I have to do all of this by myself. It was sort of overwhelming to take care of a little baby all by yourself. And and Fred was 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 a great father when David was a little older, but as a baby, that was a lot. Yeah. But I did, I got I got a a nanny who was um, Russian, yeah. and and she started yeah. to swaddle him and and take him out into the ice cold, and he began to look like her. Anyway, that's another <laughs> story. <laughs> But you, you know what I mean? Like you, 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 until you've had this experience. And then I, I think what bothers me about even in this story, sort of acknowledging that there are going to be these quote unquote unequal relationships and women are the ones who 
who by and large choose to, to make that sacrifice when in, they're in situations where they can choose. But I have known a few, I've run into a few couples where it's the reverse. They both have jobs, but hers is one of these jobs where there's a the more important, huge right. uh, benefit to long hours, and they switch. And the, I, what I find is these stay-at-home fathers, it's relatively rare, but it can work. They, as long as they aren't held up to the standards of the typical mom because they're a little different. Stay-at-home dads just do it a little different, <laughs> in my experience. And, and uh, not, to the, not to the worst. No, but I mean, the, this idea that um, we have to, you're not equal or you're making a poor choice by doing this. That's what, oh, and, when they, and even when they're talking about the, the wage gap and acknowledging that women drop out, that it's somehow a bad and detrimental thing. And, you know, and how do we get more women back in the workforce faster without ever considering the greater dimensions of why, you know, why women do this? And then they'll say, oh, we need full-time daycare and we need to have, uh, you know, government-funded preschool and all that. They've got that in Scandinavia and it still hasn't closed the wage gap. And in fact... It's a complicated issue, but it's called the Nordic paradox. In many ways, Scandinavian women are behind American women in terms of breaking the glass ceiling. But it's also, and, and, and if, again, to take one more step back about this, from this, is that the couple that they describe, this New York lawyer couple, you know, the marriage contract used to recognize that, you know, it's default setting that the woman would either pass completely not work or at least definitely step back and that's a real risk that this woman is taking right and you know that the 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 deal that this couple is making is that she will share in the husband's gains right like you're you're now you're a family unit you know so he's going to go work the 80 hour weeks you'll cut back but in the long run, it'll all work out because it's money and, you know, we're going to share everything in that. And then if the marriage doesn't work, I mean, that's that remains the scary thing. And that is the real risk to any woman who, you know, you don't have as many protections as you once had. Yes. Uh, in the old days before the no fault divorce and all that, even if it was fairly rare for marriages to fall apart, for better or worse, but if they did fall apart, this structure of responsibility remained in place, and he was responsible for, you know, taking care of her in the, you know, to, to lifestyle she was accustomed. That's all gone. And um, but here's the thing: when I look at this study and I look at the the Pew findings, the Gallup findings, it's also this. Uh, Researcher Catherine Hakim, she used to be at the University of London. She found the same thing in Western Europe, that uh, typically women, if they could have their way, they weren't, it was about 20% of women were full-time, high-powered careerists. About 20% wanted to stay home and have no job. And then there was a huge group in the middle, 60%, she called them adaptives, who wanted to work, once they had children, they wanted to work full time, uh, part-time. And so we, we don't have a women's movement that represents the preferences of a majority of women. Now, just think about if we had that, if all these years, and I mean, the current women's movement and so-called, you know, the gender studies experts, they can tell you all about their efforts for getting rid of a baby, like having abortion or, you know, having daycare. They, they work for that. But what about if you want to stay home with your baby? And that is the preference of a majority of women. And yet there's very little activism around that, of building a society where that's possible. And they do that better in places like Holland and Denmark, where if you want to stay home, you can, or work part-time. And we don't do it at all. We haven't, they never want to imitate that. They only want to work for the high-octane careerists. Right. Well, in, in some, I can just put this bluntly from this experience of this past week and months is you don't care if your job gets a tumor or, you know, yeah. like when your child gets a tumor, like there's, it's your life. I mean, I, I remember Miranda and I were tumor humoring, joking around. And she said to me, um, 
oh, easy for you to say, Mom, you don't have a brain tumor. And I said, you know what? Yes, I do. I that know. your tumor is my tumor. I know, it's true. you feel everything they feel. No, and the worst thing that can happen to your kid is the worst thing that can happen to you. Right. And this idea that it's best to get the hell out of there as soon as you can back to the office. I mean, I understand the economic incentives behind that. But as you say, none of these organizations, none of these studies recognize that, you know what, maybe, maybe being with your child, especially when they're young, I mean, it's exhausting and, and, you know, everything that they say about having small children, but it's also fulfilling and meaningful. I mean, I, I will never forget those days of pushing Miranda in her stroller to the park and sitting on the edge of the sandbox and watching well, Thomas Hobbes uh, or, or no, Jean-Jacques Rousseau's State of Nature. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, accident in front of the, you know, the kid who's the, the little Donald Trump kid in the sandbox is organizing all the other kids into building sandcastles and, you know, the bully. And the, I mean, I just, I, I just, they're magical times to me. And I'm very grateful that I had them. And, and I'm grateful I had a husband supportive of that. And you're right. I mean, how can we, that should be the focus of the movement. How can we just be more supportive of Well, maybe in a future podcast, I will give a little report on what they do in Holland. It's called, there's a book or an article that I read called The Country That, that Missed Feminism. And they actually are very emancipated. Dutch women are far from being oppressed. Oh, but yeah. they But they just didn't indulge the high-powered careerist uh, model of success. They're very devoted to what the Dutch call gezellig. Oh, God, who can say this? This was a oh, test yeah, in World War II to this. see if you were a spy. Can you say gezelligheid? Gezelligheid? Gezellig, <laughs> coziness. This, word. this is one of your favorite words. Yes, I do, because... In Holland, everything is so... It's Well, first of all, it's a toy country. It's like being in a dollhouse, being in that country. Everything is miniature. Yeah. And you love Holland. You, you should maybe move to Holland if things don't really work out for you. I know. If I get driven out of the country by the, <laughs> the, the, the Women's <laughs> Law Center at UCLA... <laughs> or... <laughs> you're going to Holland and you're going to just sit back and smell no, the No, but they have... But the women, even if they don't have kids, they still work part-time. And it's just a nor- and they're always getting together with their friends, and then yeah, they. Yeah, because it's this thing called life, you know. Yeah. What happened? And to this that? article did. This article did talk about like the Japanese are having like work fatigue, um, because you know what? It's 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 crazy, but being at the office for eighty hours a week, and then don't forget being online outside of that. You know, that's not life. So we need to, maybe we just need to just forget about a feminist or women's movement. We just need to start a life movement that brings back joy. And I mean, one of the things, honestly, going through this experience with Miranda is, you know, the first time we sat out on a little patio here where we are and the birds were singing and I had my gin and tonic, Miranda had her herbal tea and the, there's a breeze and you just, and the, the, the flowers are out and you just think, Oh, so grateful. Wow, this is this is lovely. I'm so grateful for this. And she's so grateful. And when can she have wine? Remember that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not gonna admittedly I'm not gonna push that That's one. It's always her. my metric for recovery. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm transitioning now from morphine to wine. <laughs> right. Um anyway, well, by the way, I wanted to say stories. one last thing about what? this article. Okay. Um yeah. And I don't think this was a serious suggestion by the economist they quote, Claudia Golden, but she sort of hinted that um, if we wanted to change the economy and actually close the wage gap, maybe we could just, I don't know, she didn't say make a law, but say make a law against overwork, overtime, that everyone would have to limit themselves to 40 hours a week. I find that and, and I'm not saying she said that, but she sort of hinted that might be the only solution. Who wants that solution? When There are workaholics. There are mad geniuses who want to work that Says long. the Twitter addict. No. That's, I mean, <laughs> my friend's father had a store. He was in that store 90 hours a week, but he loved it right. and he made a success. Look, I don't right, think but- anybody ever won a Nobel Prize on flex time. And nobody, as the old cliche goes, lay on their deathbed saying, I wish I spent more 
time at the office. I don't accept that. So. Cliche. I think I would regret not spending more time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but but anyway, yes. No, but look, when you I, want to work, when I, 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 I wanted to work, when I was I, writing books, I worked night and day, and I loved it. And if somebody came along and said, "I'm sorry, you have to go home and stop working," no, sometimes I don't work think that's is going to happen. But Michelle Gelfand, whom you missed last week, who was amazing, did say that she was optimistic. We were talking about the the sort of the blight effects of some aspects of the internet. And she was very hopeful that we would correct ourselves on this. And then like, that was very heartening to hear. And I think, you know what, I think we're going to, I have to hope we're going to correct ourselves like on this plugged in 24 seven, we're going to listen more to Ariana Huffington and get more sleep and put our phones to bed and have more, per, you know, seek out more personal face-to-face -face relationships. But we have to go through this this transitional bump, I guess. But what, does it, it have to be all of us? Can't people just, like, vote? No, Christina, you can sit in your pajamas all day and be on Twitter, and no one is going to come into your house and arrest you. Christina, I love spring. The cherry blossoms are out, the tulips are in, and everything is fresh and new. Yeah, except for spring cleaning. Then you're confronted with everything that is stale and old. I know, but you know what I'm doing this season? I'm finally getting rid of old bedding and replacing it with gorgeous, luxurious new sheet sets from Brooklinen. I've decided that, you know what? Bedding has a shelf life too. You know, that's a great idea. And I believe that the average person spends about one third of their life in sheets. And my dog, Izzy, who sleeps in my bed. She's <laughs> probably there considerably more than I am, so I could use a bedding upgrade. Well, what I love about Brooklinen is that they offer modern, tasteful designs to suit every style of decor, over 25 colors and patterns to play with, and not just sheets. Brooklinen sells comforters, pillows, towels, baby linens, and even scented candles. You can have a new luxurious sleeping sanctuary in just one click. And the luxury part is key. Brooklinen's mission is to provide five-star hotel quality sheets at affordable prices. And here's another fun fact. Most bedding is marked up as much as 300%. Brooklinen right now is the fastest growing bedding company in the world. Well, the only fact I care about is that these are the most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. And now it's time for our listeners upgrade. Brooklinen.com is giving an exclusive offer just for our listeners. Get 10% off your first order and free shipping when you use promo code FEMSPLAIN at Brooklinen.com. Yes, Brooklinen is so confident in their product. And all their sheets, comforters, towels come with a lifetime warranty. So don't miss out. The only way to get 10% off your first order and free shipping is to use the promo code FEMSPLAIN, FEMSPLAIN. at brooklinen.com. That's brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com. Promo code FEMSPLAIN. Christina, have there been studies on how long dogs sleep on average? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Oh, by the way, you came up in my talk. Um, what? When I was I arguing hear. with my, I guess it was with the UC, it was either was it Skidmore, where after my lecture, during the lecture, these people were quiet, but afterwards, this whole all the gender studies majors at Skidmore College sort of followed me and said, follow her, follow her. And they said, we have more questions. And I thought, what the hell, I'll take their questions. So I sat down, even though I was exhausted because my plane had yeah. left D.C. late. I got to Skidmore mm -hmm. like four hours yeah. late. They rushed me in the car. I go up. I had to give the lecture off my iPad because I couldn't, I had no time to print it. And I'm over. And then they, after the lecture, they wanted to do this. But okay, I did it. And they were so angry at me for questioning statistics about uh, sexual assault as if Skidmore College and these boys mm -hmm. at Skidmore were rapists, but never mind. But I, I brought up the example to them that I had encountered in Australia where this young woman had been with a young man who talked her into <laughs> sex uh, and she consented, but he'd kind of badgered her. And he badgered her, and she was. And we also think he was her boyfriend too. And he kept badgering he her. He badgered her, badgered her. But then, in, in retrospect, oh, okay. she realizes it was rape. She, I mean, that's what she called. Her. She so said I, I said to these students, 
surely you wouldn't call it that. That made them frantic with rage. Of course, she said no. He didn't accept her her initial dissent from sex. And I said, but wait a minute. Okay, like my friend Danielle calls me up all the time and wants to go out or wants to do something, and I say, no, I'm tired. I'm and she doesn't take no for an answer. She wears me out, and I go out. <laughs> oh, you out. out of your house. And I said, did she... Could I go to the police and accuse her of kidnapping? <laughs> and they looked at me like, that's not the same. <laughs> and I said, but I said no. And she would not accept no for an answer. And she argued with me. She she just... And she forced you to drink alcohol. Yeah, no, because I, as you say, I do have... What did you call me? A, 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 a potential... What is it called? Somebody that never wants to go outside? Not an agoraphobic. Oh, but, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Whatever it is. Um, but no, you, you shut in. You call me a shut in. I call you a shut in. I do. And you argue. Yeah. With me. You don't accept. You don't. Non-consensual. Am, right? am I always right? I'm, am I always right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Come on. Except say it. For, let me think. Oh, the, except for going out to that Latin dance club. <laughs> Come on, that was great. Where was mine? That was so much great fun. for you. I had to, I had to chaperone you because it was like being back with Debbie Hill in ninth grade at the airport club. But never mind. <laughs> okay, go to your story. Uh, you had a very funny one about women podcasters. All right, audience members. Um, it's kind of unbearable and excruciating. Women podcasters face discrimination for their opinions and their voices. Christina, uh, your voice has changed. What, what's happening to you? What, what, what just happened to you? Uh, well, I'm just um, giving an example. Do you know how to do that uh, that verbal? What, what is it? Tick? There's up to Valley Girl. It's all Valley Girl, and it is annoying. Are you talking and, about you know vocal fry? Like vocal fry. What vocal is fry. Vocal yes, fry. We've is, done that before. It's just like yeah. when you talk down here in your voice the whole time. So I'm really thinking. Oh my god! That I don't really know. As if, like I don't know. Anyway, so let me just read one more thing. So they're kvetching yeah. these podcasters, and they say that women are regularly criticized for not only what they say, but how they say it. Some women-led podcasts receive negative reviews online, lamenting the supposedly unlistenable tone of the host's voice. You know what? When I occasionally hear mm, certain young women on NPR, and they're talking like that, uh, but no, wait, let me do it. Oh, it's weird, and they're giving like like political news from DC. You know, right. well, the president said today. Yeah, I mean, they do. We do do it. We all do it. I don't think I do. I it. think I just did it. I don't <laughs> think you do it. I mean, I never do it. I don't even know what it is. I don't acknowledge it. It was a joke in the '80s about Valley Girls, and you know what? Young women who do that just learn not to do it because you know what it is? Women don't speak that way normally anywhere in the world. I've never heard a French woman do it, but um, it's like. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, come on. But where, what, so what, what they're saying, but what is, okay, so, so we speak differently potentially on the radio. Yes. And this is causing us, who are the women saying this? Well, what, it's a young nation or we're not getting enough listeners. What's the problem? Well, they say uh, voices that deviate. OK, let me say it. Let me say it the way they would. Voices that deviate from the white male norm are often policed as being not authoritative and not comforting and as being annoying, irritating, hard to listen to, said McGregor. Generally, what they actually mean is that this voice I don't want to listen to because I'm not hearing it as a neutral voice. Well, who's not, who are they claiming they're not hearing it? Men, but they're doing podcasts for women, so presumably... Uh, yeah, know, it's probably women. Put up with I it. don't think women can take it either. I can't take it. <laughs> but anyway, they're catching... Well, where did this story... Where was the story from? You said the name McGregor. Is it Scottish? Where is this The story Star? From? The Van the... Tur- the- Oh, it's can, it's Canadian, but Canadian women don't talk that we. Well, apparently they talk they about. Do. No, they say women's groups need more funding. That's <laughs> well, I, I don't, don't know. know. Canadian with an uptick. I can't. I can't do a Canadian woman with an uptick. I just can't do it. 
I don't. But that's hard. That's a. That's a. Maybe they're just mad that. Uh, what, what's the name? I think they're mad at the fem splainers because we don't get those complaints. We don't get. Uh, we we once had one. We did get one angry male once saying. We talk you know, over each other. Giggle and interrupt too much, and I'm like, okay, I agree. Like interrupting is annoying, but oh, I just did an uptake. Interrupting is annoying, but but on the other hand, you know, so don't listen. Like, what the hell? Go find another podcast. But so I think these women are complaining. What is the name of their podcast? The Secret Feminist Agenda. <laughs> hmm. uh, uh, you know what? You, you know, there might be another problem with my people <laughs> listening to that podcast. <laughs> Can you imagine the kvetching on that show? Endless, endless injustice collecting. <laughs> the Secret Feminist Canadian Agenda. When I order Let me I'm going to try to do this. I get less cheese curds than the male customer. Oh, cheese curds. Cheese curds. Um, I thought those okay. in Wisconsin. I thought that was a Wisconsin. I know. We, we discussed it. I know. I know. I have. Okay. Well, girls, you're speaking to women, and presumably women don't mind that. As yes, they, they mind do. I mind it terribly. Rough. I can't listen to it. Okay. And Zoe, well, you're obviously... for her credit, you don't do it. Thank you. I, I took a radio class when I was an undergraduate. And they corrected it? Mm -hmm. Did you have that from high school? No, I don't think I had it necessarily, but the, the professor was a woman who worked for Marketplace for NPR, and she talked about the fact that uh, listeners complained about her vocal fry all the time. So she gave us exercises. Okay. But you remember when actresses had to take, actresses and actors had to take elocution classes, and there was this kind of, standardized American accent, which was kind of, I guess, a little bit Eastern or Connecticut, but, you know, when you are an actor, you spoke like this. And when you went for a career in the radio or television, you had to learn to speak like this. So now they're just complaining like any old way I speak, uh, you know, is a problem. And yeah, maybe it is. Maybe you don't have a voice for radio the way that some people that cruel joke goes you know you have a face, you have a face for radio <laughs> all right all right well i don't think you're the target audience anyway christina for the feminist secret agenda so well as i don't know why you say that that seems so exclusionary <laughs> i'm gonna watch it. all right i think zoe had oh, zoe so has you, something you were, that you were a bit Seeing a secret feminist agenda, Zoe had some article that she didn't really want to share with us in advance you know, because she just wanted to get our reaction. <laughs> I just it. sort of feel like I get stuck with some of the real weird ones on this show. Yeah, well, Zoe, you're young. You you're young. Okay. Our careers are embarrassment. You know, I, I vulnerable. Would, you just have to be protected. That's fine. I, I would argue that this is probably the weirdest thing that we have ever talked about on this show. Oh, my God. After oh, I've wow. done further research about what I'm going to say, it's, it's okay. Have either of you ever heard of the term ecosexual? Thank God, no. Nope. So nope. ecosexuals refer to people that believe that they can uh, halt climate change or make the earth better by engaging in sexual activities with nature. Wait, that that doesn't work? What? <laughs> uh, so, so uh, apparently ecosexuality, um, according to a psychologist who works at the UNLV School of Community Health Sciences, says that ecosexuality can be measured in a sense that is similar to the Kinsey scale, so on one end, you have people who just want to use sustainable sex products that are better for the environment, which sounds like a great idea to like me. Biodegradable condoms, lubricant. things like that. Okay. Right. But then you have people on the other end of the spectrum who roll around in the dirt, having an orgasm while being covered in potting soil. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now I mean, I like gardening as much as the next person. <laughs> well, these are people that like to have sex with trees. No, or, no, wait a minute. I have a problem. Ow. Can the potting soil consent? Well, there you go. <laughs> That's no, true. So Can there the are... Tree consent? There are and, the, and the tree or... This is what we would call like earthy sex. Like, yeah, but I've yeah. Had, I have had... Um, let me... How do I put this? Like some intimate encounters with waterfalls. Well, this, this, they said that some people like to masturbate 
underneath a waterfall. Oh, God, no. Hey, you know what? Harvey Weinstein, when he was ejaculating into potted plants. Oh, my God. <gasps> he's an ecosexual. He was misunderstood. Oh, oh so misunderstood. So, so th- this was this came from a Vice article because right now in Sydney, <laughs> Australia, they have an ecosexual bathhouse that you can go and visit. Ugh. And so I looked it up, and it's a it's a bathtub that is filled with soil, and it's in this small room, and you can go in and you can. Oh, it seems like the hot like, tub at the Playboy like, Mansion in the grotto. No, it seems like a kitty litter box. <laughs> oh, yes. You're gonna go in that dirty kitty litter. Oh box. God. But some of no. the other, so some of the other activities that you can do is they have finger condoms, where you can stick your finger into an orchid. That's kind of hot. hot. <laughs> some of the pictures have people. It's so it'll be a couple having sex covered in bugs. Ah, okay, that's too much. Take it back. See, I, I so the so most how extreme. Do we, like, how do does this just lead to bestiality or buggyality or well, buggyality? Actually, Danielle, if you're interested, they actually they have ceremonies where Insectophilia. you can <laughs> where you can marry the earth, the moon, and other natural entities. Well, that's romantic. I thought the moon was taken. Yeah, <laughs> yeah apparently. Well, somebody is re- is in a quote pollen amorous relationship with the Appalachian Mountains. Oh, pollen amorous. People with allergies are in a. <laughs> no, I know, I that's how I feel about DC. With the pollen. We're going to I, divorce. I, think I, 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 I read a funny. Twitter that said, because it's allergy season, we study, well, it's allergy season everywhere, and it said, you know, they, the Twitter said, it's, hey, trees, it's really nice you're having all this sex because <laughs> you cut down on it a little for those of us having with allergies. Well, well the, oh, the, uh, this is so Echosexual. Yes. Well, the echosexual, or eco, I don't know if it's echo or ecosexual, but they, the advocates for this, apparently there are at least 100,000 people who now openly identify as ecosexual. And at last year's San Francisco Pride Parade, they had a huge uh, campaign to get the letter E added oh, to the LGBT. We added to the LGBT. Oh, my into God. The acronym. This is going to be as long as the alphabet, you know. Exactly. I'm, just gonna say, I'm pro ABC. So tell me, are um, performance artists enablers of all of this? Well, yes. This the the exhibit that's at Sydney right, right now is all performance artists. Where are they from? That's a good question. They're, San Francisco, just tell me. I, I would sort of assume so. They're from some this place. Is like, this is like the worst single person's nightmare where it's so bad, you have to have sex with dirt. Bizarre. So, uh, yeah, I encourage, if, if you're curious to learn more about it, just put ecosexual into a Google image search. No, you no. You will just... <laughs> There is, it is so... And is there, there like many... a marriage equality movement for dirt? <laughs> for dirt? Like, I think we should start one. <laughs> I want to marry... Yeah, what about if you're manure? Like, is manure like... Like, does Harvey Weinstein, uh, Weinstein, is that what it was all about? He wanted to marry those plants? I guess so. Yeah. You know, so like, maybe he's just a piece of understood... nature. Oh, my God. Okay, okay, we have to stop talking about this. We have a very short time left. And we, uh, haven't, done, so we, we... haven't done the fat acceptance... Person. Oh, I can't do that. I can't talk about that anymore. You had an article on uh, a woman actually from Quillette dissenting on this whole people have a problem with my weight. And we're talking like women who are 400 pounds are the yeah. ones with the and, problem. And she thinks that um, like if you have an overweight child and you suggest they should be on a diet, she says that they can't consent to the diet any more than the child can consent to having sex. So she compares putting the child on a diet to a kind of child abuse. Yeah. Okay. You know what? This is too, we, we've gone we've, we've gone, gone down too far. Such a rabbit hole of insanity that I think Zoe, we had a little bit of listener reaction. Yeah. Doing that. All right. I've got two for us this week. So, hi, Christina. And I, to be fair, they Danielle, they did write your name as Daniel, but mm. you are Daniel. Yeah, well, you know that's what? dead I, naming her. That was I'm her okay. name before she was. Danielle. (laughs) Have you told them about your transitioning? No. Okay, moving on. (laughs) Okay, so, been listening to your podcast and following your Twitter for a while now, and I love your content. It has opened my mind to a different way of viewing feminism and gender, such as removing excessive generalizations and misinformation about issues like the pay gap. 
I completed my undergraduate at a South African university where the left-wing type of excessive political correctness is taking hold and growing by the year with little room left for opposing views. You may know it already, but even the trans issues are here too. My alma mater is famous for campus, quote, rape culture allegations, so common in American universities and is a symbol of broader African conversation that seems to import so much from the U.S., just writing to say thank you for standing up for healthy feminism. Your podcast gives me hope for better discussions in our African countries from Lee. Well, that's sweet. I'm glad to know we have African listeners. That's yeah, amazing. You know, I think we, I wish that we could go there, the two of us, the femsplainers. Because uh, you know what? Yeah. After all my all my campus visits, I don't want to go alone anymore. I want to go with you, Danielle. <laughs> well, well, Lee said, I promise to get you a bottle of fine South African white wine for the white mm. wine supremacist. Oh, my God. Mm. We got South African go. wine is good. And I want to climb, uh, what's it called? Table Mountain? Tabletop Mountain? Oh, one, yeah. One yeah. of the beautiful hikes yeah. in the world. Okay. We're so, going. So, hey, and, hey, yeah, just, just pull together your <laughs> Federalist Society sponsor. <laughs> Perfect. There. Send us to South yeah, Africa. I'm sorry we're not just exporting Coca-Cola <laughs> anymore, but that was bad enough. All right. What's the next one? Thank you. Thank you for writing. Yeah. So this one comes from um, uh, someone, fr Patrick from Fairfax. So we're much closer. Fairfax, Virginia. Yes. So he says, hello, Femsplainers. During the recent episode, How to Talk to People You Hate, you questioned why more offices and WeWork type facilities don't have on-site infant and toddler care. Several years have passed since I last dealt with the regulations and codes that govern infant and toddler care, but I think the compliance burden might limit the number of offices that would provide this service. In the D.C. area, at least, infant toddler care facilities must meet rigorous requirements, which is a good thing in my opinion, regarding staffing per child, sleeping facilities, specialized staff training, handling and storage of feeding materials, and more. These requirements, plus general low pay in the industry and liability risks, not only limit such facilities and offices, but in society in general. The D.C. area has a tragic shortage of infant and child care facilities, with lower and middle income working parents particularly hurt by the lack of such care. These parents usually can't afford nannies or babysitters, but they also don't have access to or can't afford outside or infant toddler care. Best to you all, Patrick. Oh, my God. He's a, right. he's a good mansplainer. I mean, you know, right, and this goes back. This goes back to our thing, like with all these new, uh, wonderful innovations in workspaces, where they have bicycles and ping pong tables and working bars. Why can't we have daycare? And and that's what when it, I I had suspected at the time it was liability issues, and this is kind of along those lines. Like, yeah. you know, what might be a great idea for any female entrepreneur listening? Could be male, but let's make it female. Create a company that solves all a company's problems for daycare, and you just hire this company, and they come, and they open a space in your company, and they take care of all of that for a certain price, you know, we're okay, regulated. They, they we're, train super nannies, for, and yeah, yeah. That's that. You and, know and, and and don't make it the company's problem. They that's outsource it. American spirit. Yeah, that's, that's how and, we got. And, that by the way, that's why we have these private prisons. People think that it's, I don't know, you know, it's just uh, people, avarice, avaricious people wanting to make money in the private sector. It's actually because the states can't afford the liability. They're trying to unload the liability and have private right, companies. Right, so you can right. look at the, not that it's a model, um, but um, if you had private daycare, yes, we need. Yeah, just, we, just a company like Kids Are Us, you know, <laughs> they just right. come to your company. They set up the area. It meets every regulation. They 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 do the paperwork, and you just pay them. That would be a that would be a great thing. Hey, why don't we do it? Okay, well let's you know. Hey guys, if you don't help support us on We Gather or Patreon, we might Christina we might have, might have to have run a daycare franchise. <laughs> 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 All right, is that it, Zoe? I think we yeah, got that's off, it. But it's been so nice to catch up with you guys. And, I can't uh, wait till you come back and everything is know, normal. I'm still worried. Thank you for being such a help here. Well, Thank you for me being my bestie. I'm your bestie, and I'm so glad darling Mandy is recovering, and I can't wait till she's here and I that know. her dog's here and and her doggy yeah, Ringo have... can get together with Izzy, although that doesn't always go well. <laughs> Ringo can start teaching Izzy how to be 
you know, how to be a hospital support. No, animal. you know what? I want to get that certification for Izzy because I need an, emo- an emotional support Don't dog. do it to the other people on the plane, though, Christina. Can you imagine Izzy on a plane? She'd be dragged out like that passenger. No, I she. Was, I took her when she was very, very young, and um, <laughs> she ended up running up and down the aisle. But she was just a little four-pound Puff. They're going to make you put her in the baggage compartment. She was too overhead, cute. She know. was too cute. Everybody adored her. But, you know, she's a little bigger now. She's eight pounds. That's not as cute as four pounds. That's it. And, and the yapping will be like a crying she child. She doesn't yap. You know, so. I don't see the yapping, but okay. Oh, okay. 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 Just okay. saying. Okay. We'll see you soon, my dear. Uh, we'll be starting season four, May 14th. So we're going to have a little week's break. And uh, as always. Um, and a great to- lineup. An yeah. amazing lineup. And. I can't yeah. wait for this. We got a great lineup four. for season four. And it will be our first anniversary. We'll be one. We'll be oh. one years old. So we have really? to celebrate it's that. It's already? Too. Are we yeah. past it? It's only no, been a year. No, we'll be just, I think it's May 6th. But anyway, May 14th, we'll celebrate our first year anniversary. So I can't wait. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye, ladies. Bye, bye Coast Planer. Bye. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening to the Femsplainers. Stay with us by following us on Twitter and Facebook at Femsplainers and on Instagram at Femsplainers Podcast. You can always email questions and comments to contact at Femsplainers.com. We read every one. We are poured at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. And thanks to AEI Research Assistant Zoe Appler, who is our production assistant here in the studio. And thanks to Nat Frum, our audio and video editor, and occasional millennial mansplainer. And listen to us on pretty much any of your favorite podcast platforms. And please remember to subscribe and like us at iTunes if possible. Every like helps us keep our solid five-star rating. Cheers. Cheers.